Future Hacker Life Path Future. Welcome back, everybody. This is the third episode of Future Hacker with Jane, and we've been talking about the future of the gaming and entertainment industry and all those new technologies applied to that. Hi again, Jane. Hi again, Maria. Thank you for having me. So, Jane, talking about the use of augmented reality, the only big case, at least I am aware of, is Pokemon Go, which got so many people on the streets interacting with each other. And there was this huge boom, and then it wasn't news anymore, right? So I believe there are still people playing, but it's not as huge as it was in the beginning. So how do you see AR applied to the entertainment industry? And let's go further than games, but also, you know, concerts, festivals, and museums but with a more lasting engagement. Augmented reality, I think it's it's super interesting. It really is about enhancing reality, like enhancing what's already there. It's so different than many other forms of entertainment. And I think Pokemon Go is a great example of sort of like how it kind of married entertainment with the stuff around us. You know, I think AR's place is really more into making reality itself into the next social platform or the next area for entertainment. What I mean is like social platforms really helped us share this context about ourselves that we normally don't advertise, right? You can go on my Facebook profile and see where I grew graduated, what's, what town I grew up and what shows am I watching all this other stuff. Like I don't walk around telling people that it's a new layer of my reality that I make visible. And AR, I think is going to similarly, I think it plays a bigger role in bringing a lot of that extra context, the stuff that we don't naturally advertise to the surface in the real world. And that's going to change how we connect with our environment and each other and with brands and entertainment. I'm sure that many people out there have been on a long road trip, and I wonder how many people have stared out that window and, and fantasized about knowing more about all these stores and homes that you're passing by. Like, what if you could know, like, something historical happened here, or like, this was the home of somebody famous? AR, I think, can change a lot of that and bring more of that to light. And when you think about how it can change life entertainment, I can only point out a few things to imagine. Like, you can imagine attending, like, a major trade show, like, in games that would be, like, E3 or, like, CES. But, like, you know, if you go to a major trade show, like, you You can imagine looking at an exhibit and seeing the, the wait times or a description of what's in that exhibit or maybe being able to live stream what's happening in that exhibit without having to shove your way through all the people into the booth or maybe at a concert or movie, like I can imagine seeing a sea of reaction emojis rising up from the audience as you're watching the event, which would be cool. You kind of do that more manually with by clapping and hooting and hollering. But I think like also seeing that extra layer of context could be really interesting or museums I know have already been experimenting with early forms of AR. You know, back in the day, you can think of those recorded tours that like, you know, you would hang it around your neck and you walk around the museum listening to something. I know museums have been innovating on that experience and making it a lot more like location-based and interactive. But overall, like my personal opinion is I think AR gaming will probably be less common than seeing AR gamified. Meaning like you'll see a lot more game elements in AR, but not in a game. And by game elements, I mean, there's these structures like progression, like when you level up in a game or aspects of gaming around personalization, like making your avatar customized to the look that you want or putting an outfit on them. Or even things like randomization, we call it procedural, but like randomizing sort of the content that you're getting. So every time you listen or go through an experience, it feels new. Like I think these game design elements are really going to be more, you'll see more gamification in AR. AR, then you will see AR games basically. And part of the reason why I think that is just that like, I think developing games in AR just requires a completely new way of thinking. It's, it's not, you can't really take classic game design and just like slap it into AR and expect it to work. So I think it's just going to take a bit. It's going to take a lot of innovation and a while before there's like super breakthrough experiences that can surpass the high fidelity game experiences that you can already get on console or PC or like mobile even. Yeah, it makes sense. And, and Jane, according to this futurist for Paramount Pictures, uh, Ted Shilowitz, we're entering the age of screenless screen. So according to him, what a screen will look like, it's not looking like a screen as we know today. It's more like this virtual layer on reality that will feel transparent to us, maybe something like Minority Report. This is not science fiction, according to him. This is science reality. And it will happen within the next few years. So if that's true, it would be the ultimate immersive experience for the entertainment industry. So what's your thought on that? And do you believe that it's something that is actually close to us? 
Yeah, I think that's such an interesting thought. And yeah, I think it's like, I could definitely see that happening. I think the more and more as technology and all these different platforms converge, I think reality will just be part of that. Maybe we no longer see our entertainment as contained in these spaces, and maybe it does all blend together. I think things are heading towards compartmentalized reality. Instagram, for example, your Instagram page is your ideal self, right? And then you have fleets or Snapchats, which are probably more your real self, right? Because you know it'll kind of disappear. Your avatar in World of Warcraft is yourself in the Worldcraft community and in that world. So even a game like Call of Duty, where you don't have a personalized avatar, you have customized loadouts. To explain a little bit, a loadout is like, it's just tailored uh, settings and guns that you bring to you in a, a particular fight and one stop. But it, it can be pretty tailored and unique to you. So anyways, but I was listening to my husband on a work call the other day and like, he has a work voice, you know? And so we have all these different versions of ourselves nowadays. And I have to be fair to my husband. I probably have a work voice too. But I think what we'll see in the next few years is actually more of a, a bento box view of the world and a bento box expression of self that I feel like we're going to see a lot of psychiatrists and marketers and motivational speakers start writing volumes about. Our digital or inward communities uh, will converge with the real world. And I just feel like when you really look at like big franchises and, and entertainment, I feel like it's going to start being more of the condiment or an ingredient that's like in every square of that bento box and rather than being the box itself. And what are other technology trends you see rising in gaming over the next five to 10 years? So we've talked a little about, you know, the VR and AR and all those screenless screens. So what's next? What's coming out there? I read a lot of industry news. And so just to rip a bunch of buzzwords out of all those headlines, I think there's like four buzzwords that you generally see in the trades. It's metaverse, blockchain, UGC or user generated content and cloud. And just to some, quickly summarize some of these, so like metaverse, so there's a lot of conversation about this idea of creating second lives for ourselves in a, in a different like virtual world. And this concept's not exactly new. Like if you think back to Sims or Second Life, you know, it's been around, but it's a topic that I think that has persisted and just uh, continues to grow in terms of those headlines that I mentioned. Blockchain is another one that you hear a lot of, you follow gaming news, uh, especially VC investment trends. Blockchain is like, it's sort of this notion of being able to attach unique ownership and history to a digital item, which does get pretty interesting, especially if you think we're on the verge of creating one of these big metaverses in gaming. You know, something interesting that I saw the other day was like Marilyn Monroe's golden dress, like the one that she she wore when she sang happy birthday, Mr. President to John F. Kennedy. That sold for like a 1.25 million, like a lot of money. And it's just a dress, but like people, I think the fact is like people do value the story behind objects. And basically what blockchain promises to do sort of is like build that possibility for, for digital goods, right? So it is exciting. And then, you know, the next word is sort of is UGC or user generated content. And again, it's not something new, but it's just been trending in media thanks to games like Manticore, Roblox, Minecraft, etc. And like, you know, on one hand, it's really amazing to see the creativity of the community that gets expressed in those games. And on the other hand, again, just from a consumer point of view or like my personal taste point of view, I have limited free time. So like I'm personally less inclined to explore the huge vast world of user generated content because some of it's really amazing. Most of it's not, you know, most of it's just sort of like user stuff, right? As a person that plays game with very limited free time, like I want to maximize my free time and experience the best that the world has to offer. You know, all this being said, you do see a lot of interesting innovation coming from UGC, like the MOBA genre famously spawned from user generated content. Like it used to be Defense of the Ancients or Dota it was actually a mod that was created for Warcraft 3. And like, I remember trying to play that original mod. I mean, talk about barriers to entry and like high friction onboarding. It was a lot of work to try and play that game. But, you know, it was a good example of innovation coming from user-generated content. And it shows, like, how games with UGC can be a real platform for surfacing that kind of innovation. The next area is cloud, which does make a lot of headlines. Um, I think because it's like really far reaching, a lot of industries actually depend on cloud technology these days, and it's a pretty big business. You might know Amazon for its e-commerce, but AWS is actually a much bigger portion of its revenues. And there's a lot of way smarter people than me, like the brilliant minds at Andreessen Horowitz, who uh, have invested quite a bit into this idea of like cloud-based gameplay and stuff like that. So I think it's interesting, you know, there's these trends that reach the headline, but there's also an argument to be made about what's more investor hype versus like actually groundbreaking technology that's going to like really move gaming audiences. I can't see into the future on that stuff. Like I think ultimately as a player, I'm not going to buy games because of any particular technology. I just want fun. I want to connect with friends. Games are the way that I relax. And like, I just think that those are things that I don't see changing very much. Jane, I have... 
a confession. You know, before searching about the future of gaming industry and entertainment, I had exactly this image that you began the podcast talking about, you know, this lonely future with people locked in their rooms. You know, when we had our prep call and I mentioned to you, don't you think this future is going to be lonely? But that's because I didn't research, right? So people by themselves locked in their room, wearing their VR sets, but just doing some very basic research, it just seems exactly the opposite. So as you are mentioning now that you like to relax and connect with your friends and gaming and entertainment is actually being used as a way to, to share with people, to connect with people. And all these new technologies apply to that and, you know, merging reality with virtual technologies and gaming with concerts, education with entertainment. So people are actually being able to share those experiences together real time. So my question to you is, and this is my last question to you, how accessible do you think this will be to common people? Or will it be the experience for the few as most of the technologies that you know we have today? So I'm leaving that last thought to you. I just love talking to you during those three episodes. Thank you so much for your time. And, you know, please feel free to share any other final words you may have for our listeners. Thank you so much, Maria. And I've, I've really enjoyed our conversation, too. And I really love this podcast. So I'm just really, uh, really appreciative to be here. You know, I think in terms of accessibility and technology, you know, I think technology definitely has a role in pushing the boundaries of experiences, but it definitely also plays a role in making gaming experiences more accessible. Cloud technology, for example, can make gaming experiences more accessible by allowing you to play it on any device. You know, the real limiter there is going to be your access to high-speed internet, which needs to be resolved for other issues and reasons. But, you know, mobile is another example that has actually made gaming experiences way more broadly accessible. Call of Duty, for example, Call of Duty Mobile, we have over 300 million downloads globally. Mobile has really made the franchise accessible in markets that were traditionally not console. For example, like we had 50 million pre-registered to play in China and we were able to reach new audiences in Mexico and Brazil through COD Mobile as well, which made like the top five installs and stuff. And we haven't seen those kind of trends necessarily on, on console. Also with moms, actually important gamer segment that you may not know. But you might be surprised that 70% of moms play games and almost half of moms describe themselves as gamers. Kind of counter to what I was mentioning in the first podcast, but like, it's interesting. And most of those moms play games on mobile. In many cases, that's where they started. But we also find that they also play on console and PC. So I think mobile in many ways has like really made games more accessible to that particular segment of the market. And I think like overall, the real innovation in entertainment technology is just far more cultural than it is about hardware. Video games are increasingly becoming central communities that are meaningfully bringing players together. You know, this past quarter, our player base grew 23% year over year. And like the total time spent in our games increased even more. You know, I think technology is trending towards making these communities accessible and even more connected than they are today. There's just way more options and flexibilities across the screens, whether it's TV, PC or mobile. My final thought, too, is that like in terms of accessibility, I think there's a lot more that makes a game accessible than just technology itself. I think one thing that I'm super proud about uh, for Activision Blizzard is that like we've been really actively working to make sure that our games reflect our communities. If you look at the Overwatch character list, like there's 32 playable heroes and 13 of them are female, 12 are heroes of color, three are black, two are gay, one is transgender. Then you look over at Tony Hawk Pro Skater remake that remaster that we did, where it's a it's an older game. But we managed to introduce a new selection of skaters, you know, just to boost the diversity. It now has a couple female skaters, one from Brazil, actually, and another from Japan, and as two African-American women and one non-binary skater. Beyond that, too, like we're also bringing more cultures into our games, right? Like, for example, this past year, we celebrated Ramadan in a Call of Duty event or like Holi, which is this ancient Hindu festival in, in Overwatch. So like, I think representation really matters. It matters in our daily lives and in entertainment and gaming is no exception. And I feel like I'm just really proud that we're pushing the industry forward and making games more inclusive in that way. And I feel like that's gonna have as big a, an effect, I think, as, as technology making games more accessible. That's awesome. Jane, thank you so much for being with us. And you know, you have the doors open. If you guys have any news, any new technology, anything new you'd like to share with us, you're always going to be welcome here at Future Hacker. Thank you so much, Maria. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Future Hacker. Life. Path. Future.